Today's video is one that I've been asked for multiple times. It's the story of Oasis and a Liverpool band called The Real People, fronted and run by two brothers, Chris and Tony Griffiths. The paths of Oasis and The Real People crossed very early on in the Oasis story, and the Griffiths brothers were central to teaching, training and reshaping the very early, quite sloppy, boardwalk era Oasis into the powerhouse that they became. Without the influence, input and training from the real people, Oasis might never have blown away Alan McGee when he heard them at King Tut's Wawa Hut. They might never have even been signed. Now, as I've done in a few videos in the past, rather than just telling the story, I want to give you guys my sources. So we're going to start at the beginning with an extract from Getting High by Paolo Hewitt. The real people, a Liverpool group, had been going since 1988. They'd been formed by two brothers, Chris and Tony Griffiths. In December 89, they signed to Sony, and a year later, their debut album was released. The real people were offered a support slot with the Inspiral Carpets on their UK tour. And it was there on that tour that Chris and Tony Griffiths met Noel Gallagher, the roadie for the Inspiral Carpets, and Mark Coyle, their sound engineer. The Inspiral Carpets were all right, Tony Griffiths confirms, but Noel and Mark Coyle were dead sound. We got talking and all that, and after a few gigs, I found out that Noel was actually into our band. He'd bought our records and our album and seen us a few times. Shortly after this meeting, Noel and Mark were fired from the Inspiral Carpets, but they stayed in touch with the Griffiths. The Griffiths came to watch and listen to Oasis performing a really small gig at the Boardwalk in Manchester. When the Griffiths brothers arrived at the Boardwalk, Tony spotted John Bryce, who used to work for Sony. He went over, said hello, and together the pair of them watched the gig. Oasis played their customary short set to an audience of about 50 people. Bryce found it impossible to convince his people in London of the wisdom of recording a band they'd never seen or heard, so Tony and Chris decided to do it themselves. So the real people came to see them at their gig at the Boardwalk in Manchester, and they saw potential. The record companies weren't interested yet, but the real people were. The Griffiths brothers offered to record and produce Oasis to help them get their first proper demo tape together. So over a period of three months, the band would drive to Liverpool on the weekends and they would record at the Griffiths studio. And over that three month period, they recorded 12 tracks, eight of which made it on to the very famous Union Jack Swirl live demonstration tape. Paul Moody from the NME tells it like this. Used to the hard knock school of the Manchester scene, Oasis was shocked by the cooperation of their Scouse mates. Because we got our own 8-track studio, we let them come down to the dock road and record there, says Tony. They were quite naive about recording, so we'd show them how to play the songs, how to think about the structure of the songs and the dynamics. We were just helping them, because that's what bands do in Liverpool. I don't think it's quite the same in Manchester, because no one had done anything for them before. And now I'm going to continue the story with some excerpts from this, Oasis The Truth by Tony McCarroll. This book, which is a brilliant read, was released in 2010. There's no question in my mind that Noel Gallagher would have been aware of it, he would have been aware of what it said about him. And here's the interesting thing, the film Supersonic was released in 2016, and in it, of Tony McCarroll, Noel says this. We might have had words. It's quite likely, I don't know. Whatever he says is probably true. I wouldn't deny it at all. I don't know what your feeling is about that comment, but to me, I think that is the closest Noel Gallagher will ever come to saying what the book says is true. Noel was aware of the book. It came out six years before Supersonic. And he said, basically, whatever Tony says about me is probably true. In the preface to the book, Tony writes this. 
Don't worry, this isn't going to be a vicious swipe from a rejected band member. It is a recollection of times past, which I hope you will be able to relate to and enjoy once again. But most importantly, it's the truth. So as I share excerpts from this book with you, my gut feeling is that most of the actual life events that Tony relates are the truth. I think Noel Gallagher has indirectly actually said that on Supersonic. And also, I really recommend buying and reading this book. We drove up the East Lancashire Road in the van. Liam was already hyped and was jumping around excitedly. The next three months would see us change the way we rehearsed, the way the songs were constructed, and the way Noel composed his lyrics. The real people sound is probably most evident on tracks like Don't Go Away or All Around the World. It was a departure from the brash punk of Rock and Roll Star and Bring It On Down, but it was one that would change our fortunes forever. The first Oasis song that the real people got directly involved in was Columbia. The song was just an instrumental loop of three chords, A, D and C, that was originally just an instrumental designed for Liam to walk on stage to at the beginning of a gig. According to Tony, the song developed out of a band jam session, so it was basically written by the whole band. According to Chris Griffiths, the writing of this song actually predated Noel joining the band. So, who wrote Columbia? This is what Tony McCarroll says about the recording of Columbia. It was our second week in Bootle with the Reelys. One of our earlier rehearsals had developed into Columbia, a simple instrumental that needed finishing. Liam sang a melody quietly to himself, while Chris Griffiths plucked away on his acoustic. Crash, bang, wallop. Oasis and the real people collided. It sounded bang on and in the next couple of hours it was completed. And we had another new song. We headed back to Tony Griffiths and Noel and sang the new melody and lyrics to them. We told him that Chris had come up with it. Noel looked proper chuffed and was immediately repeating the melody. Liam then proudly told Noel that he was involved in the writing as well and Noel's smile seemed to vanish as quick as the light after the flick of the switch. And Tony's story lines up exactly with Chris Griffith's story. Have a listen. We had a question from one of our guys on the Live Forever forum sort of asking about that Columbia. The genesis of that, correct me if I'm wrong, is that Liam had come in with some lyrics but because it had hung around from kind of pre old days even but then you sort of put together you know, some of the other lyrics to it. Well, the whole story is, it was an instrumental song. He recorded an instrumental. Like, this, this track is too good to not have, not have lyrics, it's to be an instrumental that you walk on to. So I grabbed the mic and just in one take, sang, there be where, here we are, all this confusion, nothing's the same to me. But it's all, all of the first days. Yeah. Uh, Liam comes down, likes it, and wrote, Liam wrote the chorus. Liam wrote, I can't tell you the way I feel. Yeah. And then Noel wrote the second verse. And then I wrote, I wrote all the, um, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, to answer the question, who wrote Columbia? This seems to be the truth. The original instrumental was written by the whole band, minus Noel. It seems to have come out of a jam. The first verse and the vocal ad-libs were written by Chris Griffiths. The choruses were written by Liam and only one line of lyrics was actually written by Noel. What I heard is not what I hear. I can see the signs, but they're not very clear. He didn't write the melody. He didn't write the chords. He wrote one line of lyrics. But if you look in the credits on any version of Columbia, you only see one person credited for the songwriting. No prizes for guessing who. Noel Gallagher. Chris Griffiths apparently still has the original reel-to-reel -reel where the band recorded their instrumental and he sang the lyrics for Liam to learn. Have a listen. I've still, I've still got a, a, a reel-to-reel of a rock and roll style and um, I had a reel of, of Columbia as well with, which had me singing the verses which with the, with the ways that I wrote at the time. Paolo Hewitt tells it this way. Noel had the chord structure for Columbia but he had no melody or lyrics. 
One night, Chris Griffiths sang a melody over it, which began with the words, There we were, now here we are, all this confusion, nothing's the same to me. That was the thing that started it off, Griffiths recalls. And it was Liam who wrote the chorus, I can't tell you the way I feel, because the way I feel is oh so new to me. A collaboration then, yet when the song was released, Noel Gallagher was the only name credited. Similarly, the fact that the eight-track demo of Alive ended up on the B-side of the band's second single, Shaker Maker, was a contentious point. Chris said, That kind of pissed us off a little bit. The fact that three months of our work was getting put out and creation records are making loads of money out of it. But see, we're not asked. If we had wanted to suit Oasis, we would have already done it. So, if all those people were actually involved in the writing of Columbia, why is only Noel credited? That question was also clearly in Chris Griffith's mind. Apparently, after Oasis took off, he began asking Noel when he was going to be credited for his songwriting on Columbia. But have a listen to this. There were so many little fingers, so many little coincidental songs that sound similar or riffs or little words or sayings that uh, I was getting pissed off with it by then and we'd I'd, I'd, I'd approached Chambers regarding Columbia because it was always it was always a case of no, don't worry about it, your name will be on it, do you know what I mean? We've only just done this first pressing of a hundred thousand. Next time it comes about I'll let the publishers know and uh, your name will be on it, don't worry about it, do you know what I mean? And your name never got on to, to Columbia. So Time passed, and the truth about who wrote Columbia was suppressed and buried, presumably by Noel and Alan McGee. Next, we jump forward a bit in time. Supersonic, recorded and produced by The Real People, has been released and has charted. Shaker Maker has released and been charted, and now they're putting out Live Forever. And to tell this part of the story, I'm going to read to you once again an excerpt from Tony McCarroll's brilliant book. Our third single was a stormer, and my personal favourite. Our first top ten hit. I suppose if anything reminded me of the fantastic time we had in Liverpool, it was this song. Noel was furious though, after reading an NME review that alluded to the same. I had this lot marked down as the Beatle-browed saviours of rock and roll and more, as the real people for 94. Remember the real people? Scally bruisers with a heavier take on baggy, a taste for scrapes and an inevitable obsession with the Fab Four. The fact that John Mulvey had alluded to the influence of the real people had upset Noel's equilibrium. To throw petrol on the fire, I asked if they would get their production credits on Supersonic. Noel seemed less than amused. A few pages later, it's the 11th of September 1994 and the band are sitting in the airport lounge waiting to go on tour in Japan. We were sitting in the airport lounge waiting for the shuttle to London when Noel told everyone that for whatever reason they were not to put the real people on any future guest lists. This came as a shock to everyone. Liam told him to f*** right off. I'll put on whoever I want, he said angrily. And then I'll take them off, came the reply from Noel. He would soon take to checking the guest lists and removing people he didn't want. This would cause constant problems for the rest of us. The recordings from the studio in Bootle and also the recording we released as Supersonic had original production credits to the Claggies. This is what Noel would call the two Scousers as a joke and was part of the deal we struck when we had arrived at their door with a desperate look and three songs. I have noticed no production credits on the album's version for them though. Following that conversation in the airport, Noel never seemed to acknowledge the real people in future years. Even when talking about the writing and recording of Columbia, he only said this. You could tell the lyrics of it in Liverpool, it's very scarce to say, there we were, but now here we are. <laughs> <laughs> it's all this confusing, not the same to me. We were at the Real People studio in uh, Liverpool, and somebody went, as somebody always does, hey la, you want to like some f***ing weirds for that? All I remember about the night is there was a, there was a lot of acid taken. Everyone was tripping, weren't they? 
everyone was tripping in the studio. We, we'd done the demo that subsequently ended up getting about 50 plays on Radio 1, all cabbaged beyond belief. And so, with all the ties having been cut with the real people, having all the money, all the power, and Noel being the arch song thief that he openly admits to being, he stole another one. That song was Rocking Chair, which they recorded during the Morning Glory era, and once again, no songwriting credit to the Griffiths. With Rock and Chain, obviously my name wasn't on it when I come out of the deep side, I'll, I'll roll with it. So how come you uh, get the co-write credit on Rocking Chair then? No, there's just a complete, it wasn't a sit down and co-write, it was a complete list of a song that I had called Growing Old. My verse in Growing Old, man, I'm older than my attitude. Colder than you'll ever be There's nothing left to say to you Nothing left to say to me And then my brother went on the same session Where you were talking about bringing on down No one played our kids He said, I've got some new B-sides here I'll play you So I can listen to them I can't get What are you doing? He's like, oh yeah, I've heard it somewhere before He said, you fucking know it is, you know So as I say, that was just another complete list It wasn't even like asked of, asked for or anything It all came to a head in the Be Here Now era, when Noel literally lifted an entire chorus, almost note for note and chord for chord, from a Real People song. The Oasis song that he stole was Don't Go Away, and the Real People song that it came from is a song called Feel the Pain. You can find it on Spotify, and if you listen to it from about 1 minute 32, it is identical. Mate, don't go away. If anyone, I mean, anyone that listens to this has heard this because I've, I've, I've dropped it in a couple of times. And what I've done is where you just play the clip of the Oasis Don't Go Away song and then you just drop in the, Feel the Pain. And it's ridiculous. When did you first hear that? And what was your reaction? I was actually listening to the, the album the day it came out in um, my ex manager's recording studio. I just said, uh, Don't go away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I went, Song, there's no exaggeration. I punched, punched the hole in the ceiling. We thought well, it's still there. Now it was in the Art Pink Museum, the Art Studio. We were in his office and uh, like in, uh, under the stairs and I punched the hole in the ceiling. At this point, having been robbed, lied to, taken advantage of, stabbed in the back, and then cut off three times over by a now super rich rock star who they had helped to launch, the real people decided enough was enough. They decided to go to court to finally sue Noel for what was rightfully theirs. When we were trying to get our name on the record, we were badly advised by solicitors and everything. It should have been silly. We should have took a lot more money on it. I should just held on to get my name on the record, which is, which is all I wanted. I just yeah. wanted. It didn't matter if I got 5% of it. Yeah. I just wanted my name on that record. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we, we actually went to court. This was, this was the sort of thing, you know, listen, we'll give you a little bit of money. You can get about the other two songs because your legal fees are really high at the moment. And all they were doing, all Noel was doing, he just sent my solicitor a letter, so my solicitor had to send him a letter back. Okay. But he was just more or less trying to make us go bankrupt, because by sending a letter, so in the end, our legal fees were astronomical. You're fighting with someone who's got so many millions of pounds, and, and you've just earned a little bit of money for the first time in your life. Mm. You know what I mean? And it's not, it's not a lot, do you know what I mean? And it's getting it up by court costs mm. uh, for something that you shouldn't be fighting for. Yeah. I took... So then my name getting put on to Rock and Cheer and a, a small payoff yeah. for the other two tracks, which was a really silly thing to do at the time. Yeah. So in the end, it's just like, oh, fuck this, you know what I mean? Give us a little bit of money, pay the solicitor, pay that. And do you know what? In the end, everyone knows. Everyone knows the truth anyway, so... Exactly. So, following the court settlement, Chris Griffiths was supposed to get a songwriting credit on Rocking Chair. However, that never materialised either. He got credited in one place, and that's in the Oasis chord book. If you go onto Spotify today and click on information on Rocking Chair, it just says, written by Noel Gallagher. Just as in the early days with Columbia, Noel promised to give credit where credit was due, and then just never delivered. So, as you heard in that clip from the Oasis podcast, the Griffiths ended up settling out of court with Noel. And with the out of court settlement, I think, there were NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, 
When the real people signed the NDAs, it bound them to not talk about these private matters. However, Tony McCarroll did not sign an NDA. He released his book, putting all this information into the public domain, so the NDA was now completely pointless. The information that Tony shared about the history of the real people was now globally known public knowledge. So it's actually massively thanks to Tony McCarroll that the real people are pretty well known now to have been massively involved in the formation and the sound of one of the greatest British bands of the 90s and that they were also betrayed, tricked and robbed by Noel Gallagher. It can be hard to understand why Noel Gallagher did what he did. I wonder what happened just previous to that conversation with the band in the airport to make Noel decide to cut the real people out. I wonder if it was a conversation with Alan McGee about maybe losing royalties or something. I wonder if there was an argument between Noel and one of the Griffiths brothers about their lack of songwriting credits. I wonder if it was just simply greed. I wonder if Noel realised I can cut these guys out and have all the money and he just wanted to. We may never know. The confusing truth of the matter is, no one's all good and no one's all bad. We're all a mix of the two really. So you can get really great people who sometimes do really shitty things. We're all a mix of the two. And we've all in our lives had moments where we've done kind of heartless, ruthless things. I think all of us can look back and go, that was a bit of a mistake. I think we've all had our moments where we realized in hindsight that we took things a bit too far. I suppose if you have a moment like that, scaled right up on the world stage as a multi-millionaire rock star, the size of the selfish act is going to be scaled right up as well to the size of something as monumentally wrong as Noel's treatment of the real people. But I think I should close this story with a quote from the man himself. In the supersonic documentary, Noel, I believe, pretty much endorsed Tony's account of things. And he also said this about himself. Liam's like a dog and I'm like a cat. Cats are very independent creatures. They don't give a f right bastards. I'm a cat, okay? That's just what I am. I've accepted it. I'm a bit of a bastard. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm moving in from that.